Uh, hi, friends. I'm your old pal, Papa Dale. I'm a retired pastor, teacher, theologian, and professor with over 50 years of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Dale Warren, but professionally, I'm known in my writing, teaching, and lectures as D.A. Warren. But my friends just call me Papa Dale, so you can do. You can see the details of my personal testimony, family life, education, and ministry experience on other videos on this playlist. So, for just for now, let's get right to today's topic, which is First Kings. This is the JHI Jan Hus Institute Bachelor of Arts in uh, Biblical Literature degree. And it is a lecture on First Kings. So, here we go. Today we're delving into the book of First Kings, a significant part of the Old Testament that narrates the history of Israel's monarchy. From the reign of Solomon to the division of the kingdom, First Kings is packed with wisdom, drama, and lessons that are still relevant today. Let's explore this historical setting, main themes, key characters, and more through an evangelical lens. So, Grab your Bibles and let's get started. The division of the Book of Kings into 1 Kings and 2 Kings originated in the early history of the Bible's text transmission, primarily influenced by practical and literary reasons. The separation occurred during the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, and this translation was known as the Septuagint, or the LXX, and it happened in the 3rd century BC. This division was later adopted into the Latin Vulgate and subsequently into other versions of the Bible, including modern English translations. The primary reason for the division was just the length of the text. That's all, nothing deeply theological. The original Hebrew text of Kings was lengthy making it impractical to fit on a single scroll. thing was, you know, that big around. By dividing it into two parts, scribes could manage the physical constraints of scrolls more effectively, facilitating easier handling and reading. So the book of 1 Kings covers a period from approximately 970 to 853 B.C., starting with the final days of King David and ending with the reign of Ahaziah. This era includes the zenith of Israel's power under Solomon and the subsequent division of the kingdom into Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. The book addresses the political, religious, and social dynamics of this crucial period in Israel's history. The events in 1 Kings primarily take place in the unified kingdom of Israel and later the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Key locations include Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, and the religious centers of the Israelite nation in Samaria, which becomes the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Other significant locations include Bethel, Gilgal, and various high places where illicit worship occurs. 1 Kings was written to provide a historical record of Israel's monarchy, illustrating the faithfulness of God's covenant and the consequences of the king's adherence, or lack thereof, to God's commandments. The narrative aims to show the reader the importance of the obedience to God and the dire consequences of idolatry and disobedience. So what's the storyline? Well, 1 Kings opens with the transition of power from King David to his son Solomon. See 1 Kings 1, 28-53. Solomon, famed for his wisdom, see 1 Kings 3, 5-14, fulfills his father's dream by constructing the temple in Jerusalem, see 1 Kings 6, and ushering in a time of prosperity and peace. And here's how it all began. King David nearing the end of his life, appoints Solomon as his successor, despite attempts by Adonijah, another of his sons, 
to seize the throne. Solomon's ascent to power is marked by consolidating his rule and securing his kingdom. See 1 Kings 1, verses 28 through 40. Solomon's reign begins with a request on his part to govern the people, which God grants along with wealth and honor. Let me read this again. I think I missed a word. Solomon's reign begins with a, cur- with a request for wisdom to govern the people, which God grants along with wealth and honor. See 1 Kings 3, verses 5 through 14. His wisdom is showcased in the famous judgment involving two women claiming to be the mother of a baby, 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28. It is one of history's most famous events. Everybody knows about the splitting of the baby story. In this story, two women come to Solomon, both claiming to be the mother of a living baby, each accusing the other, pardon me, of having accidentally smothered her own baby. Solomon proposes to cut the living baby in two, giving half to each woman. The real mother immediately cries out to give the baby to the other woman to save its life, while the other woman agrees to the division. Solomon then declares the first woman to be the true mother and gives her the baby, demonstrating his wisdom to all of Israel. Well, next, Solomon undertakes the monumental task of building the temple in Jerusalem, fulfilling his father David's desire. The temple's completion and dedication signify a high point in Israel's spiritual and national life. This was a gigantic task. Solomon's temple, or the first temple, was a grand structure described in the Bible. It stood about 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high, or approximately 90 by 30 by 45 feet, or 27 by 9 by 14 meters. It was built on a 500 cubit square plot, or around 750 by 750 feet, or 230 by 230 meters. The temple was ornately adorned with gold, cedar, wood, and precious stones. Its interior featured intricate carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, all overlaid with gold. The walls and furnishings, including the Ark of the Covenant, were richly decorated, reflecting its importance and sacredness in ancient Israelite worship. It was widely considered one of the most beautiful buildings of the ancient world. Now, despite his early success, Solomon's later years are tarnished by idolatry, which was influenced by his foreign wives. See 1 Kings 11, 1 through 8. And this led to his downfall. As a consequence of his unfaithfulness, God's anger results in the division of the kingdom after Solomon's death. See 1 Kings 11, 9-13. And then the kingdom is split in two, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Jeroboam becomes ruler of Israel, 1 Kings 12, 20, that's the up north nation, while, Jerobo- while Rehoboam takes the throne in Judah, the half of the nation left in the south, and that's in 1 Kings 12, 21. Upon Solomon's death, Rehoboam's harsh policies prompt ten tribes to secede under Jeroboam, forming the northern kingdom of Israel, while Judah and Benjamin remain loyal to Rehoboam in the south. See 1 Kings 12, 16 through 20. The narrative of Israel predominantly focuses on a succession of kings who lead the nation into spiritual decline, epitomized by the wicked reign of of Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who promote Baal worship and persecute the prophets. See 1 Kings 16, 29 through 34 and 1 Kings 18, verse 4. Well, in response, the prophet Elijah emerges as a pivotal figure, challenging Baal worship and performing miracles. See 1 Kings 
chapters 17 through 19. The prophet Elijah confronts Ahab, leading to dramatic events such as the contest on Mount Carmel, where God demonstrates his power by consuming Elijah's offering with fire sent from heaven. See 1 Kings 18, 20 through 40. Now, in this event on Mount Carmel, between the prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal, described in 1 Kings 18, Elijah challenges 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see whose God can send fire from heaven to consume a sacrifice. Despite the prophets of Baal's efforts, their God does not respond. And then Elijah prays to the God of Israel, who sends fire from heaven to consume the offering of wood, the stones, and even the water in the trench around the altar. This event leads to the people of Israel recognizing the power of the Lord and the sub subsequent execution of the prophets of Baal. Main themes in 1 Kings include the sovereignty of God, and we see throughout 1 Kings that God is in control of the nation's destiny, regardless of the king's actions. He raises and deposes leaders according to his will, 1 Kings 11, 9-13. And then there is the theme of covenant faithfulness. The book emphasizes the need for the kings and the people to remain faithful to the covenant established at Sinai. Obedience brings blessings, while disobedience brings judgment, 1 Kings 9, 4-9. And then there is the theme of the role of the prophets. Prophets play a crucial role in guiding, warning, and rebuking the kings and the people. They are God's mouthpieces, delivering his messages and performing miracles, 1 Kings 17, 1-24. So, the main characters of 1 Kings are Solomon, who is the son of David and Bathsheba, and Solomon is known for his great wisdom, wealth, and building projects, including the temple in Jerusalem. But despite his early faithfulness, he later falls into idolatry due to his many foreign wives' influence. See 1 Kings 3, 1 through 14, and chapter 11, 1 through 8. And then we have the character of Rehoboam. Now, this is Solomon's son, who, and he, he has harsh policies, and these harsh policies lead to the division of the kingdom. His harsh policy primarily is he's going to increase taxes. He says, says something like, uh, well, I won't go into that. He's going to raise taxes substantially, and the people rebel. He becomes the first king of Judah. See 1 Kings 12, verses 1 through 24. And then there's Jeroboam. He is a, an official under Solomon who declares himself the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He establishes alternative worship centers to prevent his subjects from from going to Jerusalem to worship, and this leads to widespread idolatry, 1 Kings 12, 25-33. And then there is the key character of Elijah. He's a powerful prophet who confronts Ahab and Jezebel and performs miraculous deeds, including calling down fire from heaven and raising the dead. See 1 Kings 17, 1-24, and chapter 18, verses 16-46. And then there's also Ahab. Uh, he's a king of Israel in the north who is known for his wickedness and his marriage to the very wicked Jezebel. And this leads to the promotion of Baal worship in all of Israel. See 1 Kings 16, 29 through 34. Well, 1 Kings does have a few types of Christ. And one of them is Solomon himself. As a king renowned for wisdom and justice early on, Solomon prefigures Christ, who is the ultimate wise and righteous king. See 1 Kings 3, verse 28, and cross-reference Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. And then there also is a type of Christ found in the person of Elijah. His role as a prophet who performs miracles and confronts sin 
foreshadows Christ's prophetic ministry and his miracles. See 1 Kings 17, 1 through 24, and Luke 4, 25 through 26. Then you have a type that is in an inanimate object, the temple itself. Solomon's temple, where God's presence dwells, points to Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us, and the ultimate meeting place between God and humanity. And you can see this in 1 Kings 8, 27, and compare that with a cross-reference in John 2, 19 through 21. Well, there, there are a plethora of dramatic events in 1 Kings. One of them is Solomon's dedication of the temple. Solomon's prayer and the subsequent descent of God's glory into the temple highlight God's presence among his people and the importance of worship. See 1 Kings 8, 22-61. And then there is the drama of the contest on Mount Carmel, Elijah's dramatic confrontation with the prophets of Baal demonstrates Yahweh's power and the futility of idolatry. Fire from heaven consumes Elijah's sacrifice, turning the hearts of the people back to God. 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 20 through 40. And another big dramatic event is the division of the kingdom. Rehoboam's harsh response to the people's request for lighter taxes, lighter burdens, leads to the secession of the northern tribes and the establishment of two separate kingdoms. And this event underscores the consequences of poor leadership and disobedience to God. See 1 Kings 12 verses 1 through 24. Now, traditionally, the authorship of 1 Kings is attributed to the prophet Jeremiah, although the book itself does not specify an author. Evangelical scholars generally accept that it was compiled by an inspired author, or perhaps a group of authors, who are likely contemporaries of the events described. The book is part of the Deuteronomistic history, that's a mouthful, Deuteronomistic history, which emphasizes covenant theology and the consequences of obedience and disobedience to God. Well, archaeology uh, has a role to play in verifying the historicity of the book of 1 Kings. Archaeological discoveries have provided valuable insights into the historical context of 1 Kings. Excavations at sites like Megiddo and Hazor have uncovered remains of Solomon's building projects, supporting the biblical account of his extensive construction activities. See 1 Kings 9.15. The Tel Dan Steel, which mentions the house of David, and the Misha Steel, which records the Moabite king's rebellion against Israel, corroborate the existence of the Israelite monarchy and its interactions with neighboring nations. Now, many Bible readers will find favorite scriptures in 1 Kings. They'll memorize 1 Kings 8, verse 23, which says, quote, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You, who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. End quote. Solomon's prayer acknowledges God's uniqueness and faithfulness. And then there is another quotation of 1 Kings 18.21. And this reads, quote, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Elijah's challenge to the people underscores the need for wholehearted commitment to Yahweh. Now, 1 Kings also has implications for Christian life today. It teaches us the importance of seeking wisdom from God, as Solomon did initially. 
It warns us against the dangers of idolatry and divided loyalties, reminding us that our hearts should be fully devoted to the Lord. The role of the prophets highlights the need to heed God's word and be open to correction and guidance. Additionally, the narratives encourage us to trust in God's sovereignty, even when leaders fail and circumstances seem dire. So, in conclusion, 1 Kings is a rich narrative that offers profound lessons on leadership, faithfulness, and the consequences of turning away from Yahweh. It challenges us to seek wisdom, remain faithful to God's covenant, and to trust in His sovereignty. As we reflect on the lives and actions of the kings and prophets, may we be inspired to live out our faith with integrity and courage. Now, this has been your old pal, Papa Dale, in the year 2024, hosting the study of the giving you the lecture on First Kings. And I will remind you that if you are pursuing the Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree, that it is a requirement to read these lecture notes, uh, both in this general lecture and also the lecture notes in the analytical lecture that follows it. And uh, you are also expected to look up every Bible citation, not if the citation is every chapter in the whole book or two or three chapters in the book, but anything that is a whole chapter or smaller, you're supposed to look up, okay, and review these things. And so, Lord willing, I shall return and deliver you another video shortly. And until then, this is your old pal, Papa Dale, signing off and saying, I will be praying for you, that you will be well, and that you will be blessed. <laughs> God bless you.